Well, <laughs> this morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 1. And we're going to spend two weeks in Romans chapter 1. And I'm going to take the lower section, that is verses 18 through 32, um, and we're going to divide that up actually into to two weeks. And this morning, we will be looking at what I'm going to call a really bad exchange, okay? And uh, begin to see some things, I hope, uh, will uh, give us a better understanding of what really is going on in our culture and in our world today. So, once again, let's just give this to God. Thank you, Father, for what you are doing in our hearts. Allow your word to be open to us so that we are clear about what you are saying and that we might be drawn closer to you because of it. We ask these things in your blessed and holy name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, last week we were in Romans chapter 3, and we learned that the history of God's judgment and His mercy meet in one place, one point in time. And in verse 26 of chapter 3, Paul says, To demonstrate at this present time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. So his judgment is justified and he justifies those who believe in him. In fact, the death of his son was actually for a demonstration of God's righteousness at the present time in order that he himself might be righteous. And we spent a good bit of time talking about that. If you missed it, you can see the video uh, on, uh, on our page. So God saw his glory being despised by sinners. He saw his worth belittled and his name dishonored by our sins. And rather than vindicating the worth of his glory by slaying his people, he vindicated his glory by slaying his son. He sent his son to die on a cross for us. Now, I mentioned to you over the last several weeks that there was a particular word that you needed to keep in mind. And each of those times it had to do with God delivering up Jesus to the cross. God delivered, it was something God did. Man did not do it. God delivered his son. That was a very important word and, uh, from, from the Greek. And we're going to run into it again today in a very unsuspecting place. So in Romans 1, verses 16 through 32, we're going to see how God's righteousness and his wrath are revealed. Now, I'm going to be looking mostly at how God's wrath is revealed. Next week we'll look at how God's righteousness is revealed. But I just want to, to bring this up so that you see it. Here's what Paul says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of... Notice that. It's God's power. The gospel is God's power. Well, what's the gospel? The gospel is Jesus Christ who died on a cross and was buried and rose again. That's the gospel. And that he's coming back for us. So important. That's, the, that's what has the power of God to save us. It's interesting. The word gospel is not really a biblical word. The word gospel actually was a cultural word in the Greek society, it meant a written document that had life-changing principles. If you read that document, it could change you. We have Gospels today, do we not? 
how to win friends and influence people. Probably one of the biggest gospels around. If you read that, that uh, document and you follow it, you learn how to win friends and influence people. Right? It has life-changing probabilities. That's a gospel. So now you have the gospel of Christ, a written document, a spoken document that has life-changing principles if you follow it. All right? It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it, that is, in the gospel, the power of our salvation, in it the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, that is written, that just shall live by faith. Then he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God's wrath, the word, the word reveal is an interesting word and we'll, we'll just take a kind of a moment to, to look at that. God's anger, you get angry, God gets angry. God's anger is expressed, happens in a moment. But his wrath is unwrapped. That's what revealed means. It's an unwrapping, an unfolding. One is momentary, the other is dispensed over a long period of time. When sin occurred and, and, and when, the, the, when he, Israel you know, disobeyed God, he expressed his anger. It was momentary and it was gone. But his wrath is dispensed over a long period of time. It is unwrapped, unfolded. All right? Why? Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. What does that mean? God made it clear and apparent to the minds of men his truth. It's interesting that from the very beginning, God implanted within the minds of humanity his truth, that he existed, who he is, that he is the creator. When mankind suppresses God's truth because of and by their unrighteousness, then that unwraps God's wrath. And that's what we're going to be looking at. That's what we're going to be seeing. All right? In our time together this morning. In verses 18 through 32, we're going to see three exchanges that man has made which causes God to surrender humanity to their own desires. The same word that I told you to take note of, the same word where it says that God delivered his son to the cross, God delivered his son for <coughs> death to pay for our sin, God surrendered. Paul uses this in chapter 3 and chapter 6 and chapter 8, this same word is going to be used here. Now, take note of this because the mind does tricky things. Nowhere in this passage do we find that God has given up on humanity, but rather has turned them over to their own devices. All right? You're going to see this word, uh, you know, that God gave them over. God gave it. He hasn't given up on us. He simply surrendered us to our own desires. He says, Paul says, for since the creation of the world, take note of that, Paul is letting us know that God created, it did not evolve. Since the creation of the world, his, that is God's invisible attributes, are clearly seen. They aren't hidden at all. Being understood, that is, the mind is able to understand 
that simply by the way that things are made, simply by the way that things are made, the human eye is an interesting thing. No one can really figure out how that thing works the way it's supposed to work. It's, a, it's an amazing part of our creation. You look at all that God has created, and it, it's kind of a, and they, well, you know, it evolved over millions of years. That's the same thing as saying, I'm going to take my, well, let's take a Rolex. I don't know how many of you own a Rolex. <clears throat> if any of you do, I want to talk to you about your tithing. <laughs> <laughs> but let's take this Rolex and take it all apart. I mean, every little piece of it to the smallest amount. And we're going to throw it in a dryer. And we're going to let that dryer run for a million years. And I've got news for you. When you open up that dryer, not us, it had to be somebody else. You open up that dryer a million years from now, you're not going to have a fully functioning Rolex watch. You're going to have a bunch of parts that are all melted. <laughs> all right? God put all this together just by the way that are made. How do we see it clearly seen? What do we see? His eternal power, his Godhead, so that mankind is without excuse. God made it clear to the minds of men that not only does he exist, but that he is the creator. Okay, great, good news, bad news. Man rejected that knowledge and instead proposed the theory of creation without God which has led to the modern day theory of evolution. Back in Paul's day, back in the, you know, the centuries uh, past, man said, you know what? I don't like the God that created me, so I will create a God. Because if I create a God, then that God has to live up to my standards. And I can worship. You know that we, we are created with the need to worship. We, we have to worship something. And if we're not going to worship God, the true God, the God of creation, then we're going to create our own. We're going to create something that we, even if it's ourselves, that's called humanism. Humanism is a recognized religion and has been stamped as such. And it has made man the center of his own universe. We talked about that last week, did we not? In theocentric, God-centered, and anthrocentric, man-centered, right? So Paul continues, so that they're without excuse. Why? Because although they knew God, the true God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful but became futile in their thoughts, and their few foolish hearts were darkened. Huh. They knew about God. They knew that there was a creator. They didn't like that God. So they created their own. And their futile, it, it, the word futile means empty. It means vain. So they became vain in their own imaginations. They, you know, I can do better. I can create a better God. And their foolish hearts were darkened. So futile thoughts and foolish hearts has led to a darkness from which evil upon evil has found its mark on humanity. When my imagination becomes vain, it simply means that I believe I can do better than God. I can create better. I can do better things. I can use my 
uh, intelligence. I can use my wisdom. I can use all of the things that are a part of who I am and put together a better creator, a better God. And if I create it, then that God has to live up to my standards. If I believe in the creator himself, then I have to live up to his standards. So vain imaginations became foolish folly in our hearts and it led to a darkness. Okay? So Paul continues, professing to be wise, I can do this better. They became fools. Why? Because they changed this is going to be our first exchange. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. They built their own gods. They made their own <coughs> idols. Back then they were called Baal and Ashtoreth and all this other kind of good stuff and and the Romans had Jupiter and all, you know, Zeus and all them cool dudes. And they worshipped all of them. They created their own fantasy out of their own vain imaginations. And they had the idols. So the first exchange was one of idolatry. I'll create my own God. So God gave them up. All right? Not gave up on. Make sure you remember that. God surrendered them to immorality. Look what Paul says. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. God says, all right. You're not going to worship me. You're going to create your own gods. You're going to create, follow your own standards. I will surrender you to your desires. I will allow you to do that. I will turn you over to your own vain imaginations and see where that leads. And where it led was to uncleanness, unrighteousness, and dishonor. Who? All right? Not a good exchange. That's just the first one. Bad exchange. I'm going to create my own God. I'm going to create my own standards. I'm going to live my own life. And if I want to do this, I'm going to do it no matter what. God says, fine, let your own imaginations now, let your own vanity and your own vain imaginations create foolishness and folly in your heart. And I will allow that to turn into immorality. You'll dishonor the creation. So that was the first exchange. Second exchange. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Now some translations have a lie. But the genuine article is in every one of these things. The truth, the lie, the creature, the creator. Each of those has the genuine article. In the Greek, if the genuine article is there, you have the the. All right? And you go, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that a lie could be any lie. And that certainly within the realm of possibility, but Paul is talking about that they exchanged the truth for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So the second exchange was God's truth for Satan's lie. All right, so, I mean... Even Jesus himself told the, the uh, Pharisees who were accusing him of uh, being a, a son of Satan, and he said, I am of my father, 
uh, in heaven, he and my father and I are one, but you are your father, the devil, who is the father of lies from the very beginning. So the second exchange was God's truth for Satan's lie. You want to know what Satan's lie is? Let's go to it. It's in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. This is Satan's lie. <clears throat> then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God said, don't eat the fruit. All right? If you eat the fruit, you will surely die. Satan says, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but first I want to look at what God's truth is. Here's God's truth. For the wages of sin is what? Death. God said to Adam and Eve, if you partake of this, you will surely die. Uh, they didn't really know what death was. But God said, don't eat it because you will die. And when sin entered the world, death entered the world. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's God's truth. All right? So let's take a look at what Satan's lie is. Satan's lie has three parts. The first thing that Satan said to Eve is God's lying to you. You're not going to die. God is lying to you. And if God is lying to you, then God's word is unreliable. The third part of that is God cannot deceive you because you will have his knowledge. Satan says, look, God's lying to you. You're not going to die. Therefore, everything he said to you is unreliable. And God is trying to deceive you because he knows if you partake of this, you will have his knowledge. And having his knowledge, knowing between what is right and wrong and good and evil, you then can be godlike. You then can be all that you want to be. You don't need to follow him. You can do your own thing. Man then created his own gods to worship so that humanity's truth became the standard. So the first exchange, idolatry, was surrendered to immorality. In the second exchange, Paul says, for this reason God gave them up to vile." Passions. The first one was just immorality, to dishonor themselves. The second one, the second exchange, was vile passions. Satan's lie became man's truth, so God surrendered them to unnatural immorality. Okay? So that's step two in this. He says, for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Fact. Homosexuality, when mentioned in the Bible, is always a verb and never a noun. It's never a person. It's always an activity. I find that interesting. They, oh, well, that's just the Bible. The Bible's full of hate. We all know that. So, you know, it's, that's just God lying, God deceiving. You see how that works? 
God's just lying to you. God's just deceiving you. Everything in there is unreliable. Pick out the things that make you happy and forget the rest. All right. Let's look at it from a scientific point of view, shall we? From a scientific view, that same conclusion has been determined. There was this ideology that came out that said that human beings, some human beings, are born with a specific gene so that you are born a homosexual. There have been six major genetic studies over 40 years and it's proven that there is no such gene. The biggest one was Harvard Medical School and MIT genetics studies together over several years over hundreds of people who proclaimed to be homosexuals over several continents and their conclusion was no such gene exists. This is not the Bible. <clears throat> This is not some flaming preacher. This is science. All right? Fine. So why then does a heterosexual, if there is no such thing as a homosexual, there's only heterosexuals who involve themselves in homosexual activity, why do they succumb, succumb to a homosexual lifestyle? Why is, why is that? Well, again, let's continue with the science, shall we? According to research, there are four reasons for that choice in lifestyle. Psychology, sociology, culture, and environment. Okay? That's what, in other words, they, they come up with this concept that, it, that it's these things that cause a person to make this choice. Well, what does that mean? Psychology is how I see myself. Okay? How I look. How I talk. How I act. How I believe myself to be. I may have been abused. I may have been involved in uh, sexual abuse. I may have had rejection from the opposite sex. I, they, they don't want me, so, you know, I, I must be gay. Uh, these kinds of things happen within the mind of a human being that cause them to look at alternate ways of life because... The natural way isn't working out. Most of us here, when we were growing up, those of us who were part of Christian families, didn't even know a homosexual. The only time we ever heard about it was in whispers. No one ever really talked about it. You never heard it talked about from the pulpit. It just, you know, because true believers, they didn't, they didn't know anybody. Now in 2023, almost every single true believing Christian family either knows someone personally who is gay or has a family member who has chosen that lifestyle. That's how much it has permeated our society. So you have psychology. Then you have sociology. Psychology is how I see myself. Sociology is how others see me. People see you and they go, oh, well, I see the way you dress, I see the way you look, I see the way you act, you're, you're gay. You might as well succumb to what you are. 
So how I see myself, how others see me, then culture. How everything around me is acceptable. Homosexuality is, is not just acceptable, it is the preferred way of life now. And if you say anything against it, you get canceled. And when I put this, you know, I, I put my messages on YouTube, when, as well as on our page. When I put this on YouTube, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they erased it, you know. They said, well, you know, this doesn't live up to our standards, you know. <laughs> I'll get blocked. Culture. It's what's acceptable. And then there's the environment. And that is what we learn. It's what we're taught. <clears throat> So you have these four things. You're not made that way. You're not. God didn't make a mistake. You know. That's part of the lie too. God made a mistake. I'm not who I'm supposed to be. Psychology, sociology, culture, and environment. That's science. That's not the Bible. Okay. So Satan's lie in our modern culture manifests itself by progressive Christianity and anti-Christian attitudes. Anti-Christian attitudes is, oh, the Bible is full of hate. Hate, hate, hate. All those Christians, that's all they know is, is hate. They don't know how to love. By the way, I understand something that is so important because sometimes we do lean that way. We love everyone because God loves everyone and we love the person regardless of their life choices but we don't accept their life choices. Say, well you can't. You, you've got to accept me for who I am. No, I don't. I can love you. I can be there for you. But I don't have to accept your choice. That really gets hairy when you've got family members. Okay, it's tough. And I have seen, and it just boggles my mind, but I have seen Christian leaders who have watered down their Christian faith because they have a family member who's now gay. And so they, they, they oh, well, you know, we have to learn to accept these things. Well, that's developed into what's called progressive Christianity. You know what progressive Christianity is? Progressive Christianity is those people who have made God into their own image, and they want to worship the same God that you and I are, and they want to be looked at as Christians, and they want to be, you know, I worship God, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I go to church, and all this kind of stuff. And so the progressive Christian church says, hey, God loves you. Don't worry about your life choices. God just wants you to be happy. Now, for those of you who have been with me for five years, you know I've said this more than once. You'll not find anywhere where the Bible says God wants you to be happy. What? <laughs> no, it says God wants you to be obedient. And then this... Holy Spirit fills you with joy. <clears throat> There's a difference between joy and happiness. Okay? But progressive Christianity says, oh, we're just going to, you know, accept everything. We're, what we'll do is we'll reinterpret Scripture. That's the, the, the best way to get around all this stuff that Paul talks about here in <laughs> Romans 1 is we're just going to reinterpret Scripture to, to fit into our own progressive way, you know, that stuff was back then. Nowadays, we have to... By the way, the culture that Paul lived in is the same culture that we live in. Seven of the emperors <laughs> that had taken place since Rome was, you know, in, in this great empire were evolved in homosexuality. Homosexuality was an accepted part of the Roman culture. So Paul 
was speaking out, he was probably going to get canceled. You know? So, here's what happens. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, notice I've underlined that, there's a reason. God gave them over, here's our third exchange, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. What does that mean? They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Here's what it means. The third exchange is an attempt by man to erase God from our learning so that future generations will not know Him. What have we seen in the last decades in our educational system? Progressively worse and worse to teach our children at the very earliest stages of their life that this is acceptable. Let's get God out of this. Let's get hate out of this. Let's create our own gods, our own way of worshiping, our own standards. Let's get rid of them. Let's just erase him. Cancel God from our learning. For that reason, God delivered man, same word, to a debased mind. The word debased means literally and morally worthless, which only knows unrighteousness. So we've had these three steps. We've had three exchanges and we've had three steps from idolatry to immorality. to unnatural, vile passions, to literally a morally worthless mind, which only knows unrighteousness. And then Paul begins to list. Now, lists were never meant to be inclusive. That is, they weren't supposed to cover everything. But Paul does a pretty good job here. Yeah. Was, the mind which only knows unrighteousness, and he'd be, it, that's talking about sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things disobedient to I always wondered why Paul put that in there. Disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but what? Also approve of those who practice them. Wow. That really is, man, that, that, that just is, is mind-boggling. God says if you're going to create your own God, set up your own standards, <clears throat> I'll surrender you to those desires. If, if you're going to create your own God, if you're going to have your own idols, if you're going to do all of these things, I'm going to turn you over to vile passions. I'm going to allow your heart to get darkened. And I, I want you to know that it's not God that does that to us, it's our choices that do that to us. God surrenders us up to what we want, our own desires, something that we're yearning for. Finally, we become worthless in our thinking as far as God is concerned. 
and we practice all of those things, hating God. But as I read through those things, did it not sound like everything that we read in the news? All of the horrible stuff that's going on, I tell you, it, it's really bad. And it's going to get worse. And the thing is that our society, our culture, our humanity, not only is a part of that, but they approve. That is, they, they try to get everybody else involved in it. They, they approve of that who practice those things. Let's keep doing it. Let's keep doing this. Let's invent new things. Let's provide new ways. Let's, let's, oh, let's go to our children, our little four and five year olds, and talk to them about gender confusion. Talk to a, it's been a few months ago that, that I was talking. Uh, I try not to get into conversations with, with people on Facebook because. I, you know, I, I get a little ticked. <laughs> I'll, I'll confess, I, I, get, I get a little bit upset with some of the stuff that they're saying. And here's this young woman who said her five-year-old is already showing signs of homosexuality because she loves little girls. I screamed, what are you talking about? There's not a five-year-old girl in the world that doesn't love other girls. They all do that. They don't know what's going on. They kiss each other, you know, they even kiss a boy and they'll go, Ugh. What a horrible thing, boys. Ugh. Right? That's not gender confusion. It's being little kids. But let's just get to our children. Let's 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 get them on the right path because they're just confused. And now, in some states, in many states, it is illegal for you to try to change that thought process. You can't go to them and say, Wait a minute, you're, you're not confused at all. You're just, you know, you're just growing up. You can't do that anymore. You know? We believe the lie that God is lying to us and therefore unreliable. And God is trying to deceive us because he knows that we're smart enough to worship our own gods. It is important to remember that God has not given up on humanity, but has given us over to our own desires. The gospel will always be God's power to save us through Jesus, the promised Messiah and Savior. We love people regardless of their life choices, but we pray for them and we witness to them and share with them God's word so that the power of the gospel we can't change anyone God's power can God's gospel can Paul says and I'm going to this is where I'm going to be next week okay I, I took the last part first and I'll take the first, first part next week we'll find out how God's righteousness is revealed through the gospel we'll learn what that means Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, when he says I'm not ashamed of it, he's talking about speaking the truth of God in a culture that is exactly like ours today. Okay? He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, regardless of their life choices, Everyone who will accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and allow the Spirit of God to change their life back to what it's supposed to be 
That's the power of God. God's grace will always be greater than all of our sin. All of it. All of it. Even when that sin threatens our very soul with infinite loss. Father, thank you for the truth of your word and may we begin to recognize Satan's lie. We know that you are absolutely holy and cannot lie. That your word is always reliable because it's based on your holiness and on your truth. And that you would never deceive us, but it's Satan himself who deceives humanity into accepting the lie. I pray, Father, that we might see your truth. That you not only love the world, but that you gave up your son to die on a cross for that world so that we might not perish, but have everlasting life. That your truth is that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That all have sinned and come short of your glory. Your truth. May we allow that truth to permeate our thoughts and our life and live by that truth. In the blessed name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.